Welcome back. We're here to finish up this unit with multiple uh, testing for for uh, two comparing two populations with matched pairs for means. So what we're looking at here is we're testing, we're taking a sample of paired data and we're putting one item in the pair in one sample, one item in the other. So the key concept here is we're going to be constructing hypothesis testing and confidence intervals for these matched pairs. Um, so the idea, the matched pair design gives much more usable and much more relevant results than the independent testing does because we're, we're testing a direct difference um, between paired data. So we're, we have to have a logical link between the pairs. So we might have one sample and then two treatments. And so the pair is just the, the data value, the, the result from one treatment for that item and the result from the other treatment. So they're, they're linked because they're for the same item in the sample, just two different treatments. And this is often like a before and after case. Like uh, if you have employees and you want to test to see if they're more productive before lunch than they are after lunch, you randomly select a sample of employees, you measure their productivity before lunch, their productivity after lunch, and there is your matched pair for each employee. And what we'd actually test is we're going to subtract and get the difference in productivity, and we're actually only going to test that one set, which is the differences, that set of differences between the pairs. <coughs> With the employees, we're assuming they've all been on the job for extended length of time, so the amount of practice they get performing the job in the morning is not going to significantly change their performance in the afternoon. So that's an okay set there. If you're going to do this, like let's say we're going to introduce a totally new task to the situation and we're going to have them perform the task and maybe we're going to show them an inspirational video and have them then do the task after the, information, the inspirational video to see if it increases their speed or decreases their time. And we have to be careful there because Maybe it's not the inspirational video that decreased their time. Maybe it was the fact that they already did it once and that little bit of practice has made them better at it. So we have to be careful that we don't, when we're doing one sample and two treatments, that we don't artificially introduce a difference in performance because of things like that. And we might have spouses. If you have a male-female couple, uh, maybe we're going to say that um, husbands get more sleep than wives. So out of our pool of male-female married couples, we're going to randomly select a group of married couples, put the husbands in one sample and the wives in the other, and again, we're subtracting the, the amount of sleep the husband gets minus the amount of sleep the wife gets to see if that, the, that set of differences is a significant value bigger than zero. <clears throat> or we could do like sports uh, teams. Maybe a sports team claims that they have won their games by an average of more than 10 points over the last five years. Um, you would randomly select games for this team from the last five years, and then you would put the, the scores for this team go in one sample, the scores for the opposing team go in the other sample. In all of these cases, there is a logical match. In the first case, it's the same item in the sample, just under one treatment in, in sample one and a second treatment in sample two. In the second example here, it's spouses. They're the same married couple, just the husband goes in one sample and the wife in the other. And for the sports teams, it's the same game. It's just one sample contains the scores for our team that we're focusing on, and the other sample contains the scores for the opposing team. In either case, the only thing we're using those original samples for is we can subtract each pair to get a difference. It's that set of differences that we're going to be performing our tests on. We're going to do hypothesis testing. Typically, we're going to assume the difference is zero to see if we get something other than a zero difference. And we're going to create confidence intervals for these matched pairs. So our requirements, the samples have to be dependent. In other words, we have the matched pairs, and they have to have that logical matching. <laughs> so the first thing that we need to check is to make sure that there is a good logical pairing between the two, two um, data pairs. A lot of people, this is where they screw up this type of test. 
is they just pair things up, but there isn't a good strong connection between those paired sets of data. And that those matched pairs are randomly selected in a simple random sample from a pop population of paired data. And then we need to meet one of these other two requirements. Either we have to have a sample size of more than 30. Now with paired testing, a lot of times we do have smaller samples. So many times we don't reach that threshold of a sample size of 30 or more. So we usually meet the second requirement, which means that we have to be approximately normally distributed data. And we've had several methods for doing this. The normal quantile plot, um, we could do a box plot to make sure to see if it's symmetrical, make sure there's no outliers or that one whisker is way longer than the other. For this test, we don't necessarily need to do a normal quantile plot. It's, it's probably the best way of testing for normality, but this is a pretty, they use the term robust here. Um, this test, as long as it's even close to being normally distributed, this test will work. It doesn't have to be um, very, you know, absolutely normally distributed for this one to work. So in our hypothesis testing, our test statistic, first of all, it's going to be a t-test. When we're doing paired data or matched samples, it's always a t-distribution, so a t-test. D-bar is the mean of the differences, the sample differences. So remember, we're just doing that one set of differences. The, the original two sets of data are no, not used at all once we calculate the differences for each pair. And this is the hypothesized value of those differences for the population. So that's from our null hypothesis. SD is the standard deviation of the differences. And of course, N is the number of pairs. So we can get the p-value either from Excel or StatCrunch, or we can use our table if we need to. If we're doing the critical value method, we can use um, StatCrunch will give us the critical value, or we can use the table to get the critical value. Or we can use the, the inverse normal or inverse t calculations for this to get a critical value in Excel. To do a confidence interval, so we have our center, this remembers our point estimate. And so we replace that mu sub D with D bar. We use the, the sample mean in place of the population mean because we don't know what the population mean. And then of course our margin of error, we have our T critical and then our sample standard deviation over the square root of N. And of course, the T sub alpha over two is found in the degrees of freedom of N minus one. So let's do our, go through our procedure. We're gonna verify that we've met the, the, the requirements here, that they're paired and that they're from the they're randomly selected samples and you know, normally distributed and all that. Then we find the difference D for each pair. Then we calculate D bar and S sub D, the standard deviation. So D bar is the mean of the sample of differences, and SD is the standard deviation of those sample differences. Equivalent methods. So what we're looking at here is the the stand the <coughs> excuse me the confidence interval is going to be exactly equivalent to the hypothesis test here. The only time there's a difference is when we're dealing with proportions. The confidence interval doesn't quite exactly contain the percentage stated, um, whereas the the hypothesis test will, so there's going to be a slight difference. But unless you're right on the borderline, it's still, it, it, it's really close there as well, and it's going to give us the same result. Here, since we're dealing with means, the hypothesis test and the confidence interval will give us exactly equivalent results. So to go over some vocabulary notation here, D is the difference for each pair. So there's going to be D1 is the difference for the first pair, D2 the difference for the second pair, and on down the line. Mu D is the mean difference for the populations. Um, we don't know this, so that's what we're trying to estimate. D bar is the difference, the mean of the differences and the, the sa sample differences. SD is the standard deviation of those sample differences. And N is the number of pairs. So looking at an example here, um, <clears throat> It's a common belief that if you ask someone how much they weigh, they're going to underreport their weight. So we're going to randomly select, we're going to use males here, and we're going to randomly select eight males, and we're going to 
have them report their weight, and then we're going to measure their weight and see what that difference is. So here's a data set where we have, this is their measured weight, their actual weight, and then this is their reported weight, how much they say they weigh. As you look at those, you can see there's only one where they actually reported weighing more than what they really did. So our requirement check, these are matched pairs. Um, the matching is logical. We could do a normal quantile plot or a um, box, box and whisker plot to verify that there isn't any major skew or any outliers in this data set. So we're okay to go ahead. Of course, they are. it's from a randomly selected sample. So we've met all those requirements. We're free to proceed with the test. So here's the output from Excel stat. Now I'm going to go to Excel here. I have the data already input here. First thing we need to calculate is the differences. So it's going to equal, this is their measured weight minus their reported weight. We notice that the first person um, underreported their weight by 2.6 pounds. That's not a major amount. Down through, we see this is the only person that overreported their weight, and they overreported it by 8.6 pounds. Now, for each, for this data set, we need the mean. So, the mean of this data set, <coughs> the mean is 1.425 pounds underreported. We need the standard deviation. Now, this is a sample standard deviation, so we have to use the stdev.s. We get a 5.181 standard deviation. Notice that matches up with what we got over here, a difference of 1.425. It doesn't give the standard deviation there, but over here it'll give us a standard deviation. Actually, this gives us the variance in this one. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So this gives us an observed value of our test statistic of 0.778 and a p-value of 0.231. Now again, I don't have, I can't install Excel stat for Excel in my computer, but we do have the stat crunch. So stat crunch right here, find that in my math lab again. I can go ahead and I can calculate here I'm going to select column 3 here, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to hit compute. Um, with an expression. I'm going to variable 1 minus variable 2, and I hit compute, and you can see it subtracts for me. And it puts it into a new column. So these are the same differences we had subtracted in Excel. Um, we could do column... Oops, summary statistics for a column if I wanted to. You can see it gives us that mean of 1.425, standard deviation of 5.182. Um, that's what we got in Excel. I'm just going to put that down here so we have it if we need that information. And then let's go ahead and perform a, a test. So this is a t-test. It's one sample, and we're using the data. The data comes from variable 1 minus variable 2 column. And my hypotheses, the alternative is going to be greater than. And I'm going to ask it to show the critical value, and we are using an alpha of 0.05. So here we go. We've got a test statistic of 0.7779, a p-value of 0.2311, which is exactly what we're showing here, 0.7779, p-value of 0.2311 on either of those outputs. So what does that tell us? Well, the p-value is not less than alpha of 0.05. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis here. If we we're going to do this by hand, so we set up our hypotheses, we're making that claim that the mean difference is greater than zero, that their reported weight or their measured weight is going to be bigger than their reported weight. Um, the original claim then is not true. The opposite would be that it's less than or equal to. So this becomes the alternative hypothesis. H1 is that the mean is bigger than zero. And so the null hypothesis is that it's equal to zero. Again, we know it's really saying less than or equal to, but we always word it as equal to. The significance level is point alpha of 0.05. So we need to find a critical value for that. We'll go to our 
T table, this is again from my math lab, going to the E text and going down to Appendix A. You have to arrow a few pages to get to the T distribution. There are seven degrees of freedom here and a one tail area of 0 0.05, giving us a critical value of 1.895 there. So let's go back. I'm our critical value. I'm just going to write it up here. Oops, wrong pen. 1.895. So we will reject HO since the, alter the alternative hypothesis is greater than. We'll reject HO if T is greater than 1.895. So here's our formula for our test statistic. Just get my calculator back on screen here. So we do 1.425. Now we don't have to subtract the zero because that's not going to change anything. Divided by, in parentheses, 5.1812 is as far as I'm going to go with that. Divided by the square root of 8. Close up my parentheses and enter, and there I get the 0.7779 or 0.778 if we round to three decimal places. That is not greater than our critical value of 1.895, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis again. If I want to find the p-value of this, I go back to that table, 7 degrees of freedom, and I see that... Um, the 0.77 is less than this value here. So all that can tell us is that the p-value is bigger than 0.10. We can't get an exact p-value, but we know that the p-value is greater than 0.10, which is not less than 0.05. So again, we would fail to reject based on the p-value. So this is just the illustration of what we just went through. The p-value of 0.231 is not bigger than, there's not less than alpha, so it fails to reject. Excel could give us that exact p-value if we wanted to. So it's going to equal one minus the T inverse. Our probability, oops, sorry, not T, one minus T inverse. We want the T distribution here with X is going to be 0.778. Eight degrees of freedom is seven and cumulative. And so now that is going to be the less than value. We want the more than value. So it's going to equal one minus that to give us the 0 0.231 that we've got for our p value. Not less than alpha, so we fail to reject. Remember this t distribution always gives us the probability of being less than the value put in here. So because we want a greater than, that's why we had to come back and do one minus to find the complement of that. Also, the critical value, we could use Excel to find the critical value if we wanted to. We could do the equals T inverse. We could do 0.95. Remember, it's probability to the left. It's 0.05 on the right tail, so it's 0.95 on the left tail with 7 degrees of freedom, and we get the point. That is not what we needed. Let's do the 0.05, see if that works out. So there it is. We would have a critical value here of 2.36, and that's not working out right either. Do I need a... okay. So the T inverse is not coming out real well here. There's got to be another command. Let me expand my window. There we want to do the T dot inverse. Oops. So the probability of 0.95 is the probability to the left. You use a freedom of seven. Let's see what that comes up with. There we got it. So it's the T dot inverse that I needed, not just the straight T inverse to give me the 1.895, which is what we had for our critical value. Again, we're not greater than that. So that means our critical value is Somewhere in here, 1.895, we did not get into that rejection range at all. 
the test statistics over here. That's what this is saying. Here's our critical value. Here's our test statistic. We did not make it into that rejection range. So no matter how we look at it, we failed to reject. Now let's look at StatCrunch and get a readout from StatCrunch on all this. So we had our readout here. This is our test statistic. It gave us our critical value, which is what we've been finding, and our p-value. Um, confirming all the calculations we've done with Excel or with the table. The only problem with the table is all the table can tell us is that the p-value is bigger than 0.10. It can't give us an exact value. <clears throat> so moving on. The way we're going to state this is we failed to reject the null hypothesis, which means we cannot conclude that, there's a, that the re actual weight is greater than the reported weight. So there's not sufficient evidence to support the claim that there's a, a difference between actual weight and reported weight. Doesn't mean that there isn't a difference, it's just we did not have sufficient evidence to support that claim. So we failed to reject the notion that they are equal, that they're the same. If I want to create a confidence interval, now remember because this was a one-tailed hypothesis test, alpha of 0.05 is all on the right tail. For a confidence interval, we have two, there's always two tails, so there's 0.05 on the other side. So we're going to use a 90% confidence interval. There's 0.05 on each tail or 0.10 outside of the interval. So it's 90% inside the interval. So we'd use a 90% confidence interval. In StatCrunch, I'll go ahead and do that quick in StatCrunch. This would be TSTAT, one sample with the data. We're using the var variable one minus variable two column. And we're looking at confidence interval, 90%, not 95%. We can show our critical value if we want to. Now, this is going to be a different critical value because it's now 90%. So this gives us from a negative 2.05 to a positive 4.90, basically. Um, critical value of T is 1.895. So we get the same critical value of T um, just because it's the same tail. So let's go back and interpret this confidence interval. Make sure that gave me that did give me the same information. So if I'm looking at this as a number line, zero is somewhere in here. This is going from a negative 2.046 to a positive 4.896. That means zero is well within that interval. And so we cannot make any conclusions about the mean of the differences. The mean difference could be negative or positive, or it could be zero. So that supports that we failed to reject our null hypothesis here. If we wanted to do the confidence interval by hand, we're going to calculate our margin of error. The T sub alpha over 2 is our critical value, 1.895. Take the sample standard deviation of 5.1812 divided by the square root of 8. Gives us our margin of error. I'll show you that calculation here. Or maybe not. Maybe, oh, there we go. Um, 1.895 times, I'm just going to go 5.1812 divided by the square root of 8. There we go, 3.471 is our margin of error. We use our point estimate of the difference. That was the mean of the differences. That's the 1.425. Remember we found that right here. Oops, right there. And we subtract the margin of error to get the lower limit of negative 2.05. We add the margin of error to get the upper limit of 4.90, which is the same confidence interval we just had up here, just rounded to only two decimal places instead of one. So that confirms that since that 90% confidence interval contains zero, that we cannot make any conclusions about the difference um, between those paired data. Now, because this is a small sample size, only eight pairs, um, some people get nervous. And, and typically when we're doing match samples, we are dealing with small sample sizes. So there are methods out there that we can expand the data, the resampling and stuff like that. As we've mentioned before, those are methods for a more advanced course than this. I'm just mentioning that those methods are out there. We're not going to use them in this course. So that is all that we're going to do with tests for 
two sample, two populations. We're not going to do tests for variances or any of the resampling techniques um, in this class. Tests for variances and standard deviations, as we've mentioned before, are for a more advanced statistics course. So that is it for this unit. Um, next week, moving on to other types of tests.